hello there. Good afternoon or good morning if you happen to be located on the Western Hemisphere. I'm John McNertney and um, I'm at GreenOceanGlobal.com and today we're going to be talking about uh, IRAs and how to use your retirement accounts to do things that you wouldn't normally do. I'll take the screen share off for just one second to say hello. Hopefully that you are doing well. So why talk about this in the first place? I'm an investments professional and I don't always do this work directly. But to be honest, I get this question often. How do I use my IRAs, my Roth IRAs, or maybe even my 403Bs or 401Ks? How does this vegetable soup contribute to the purchase of investments that aren't stocks or bonds? And so that is going to be the subject of what we go through today. Um, just as a housekeeping note, if you can hear me, please hit a button on your screen here just to know that, uh, so that I can know that, um, <laughs> that I'm live. It's funny when you do things, these things, you, you really don't know. Um, ah, okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, okay. So here we get going. Um, disclosures. As always, I need to tell you that this is just for fun. We are just going to be sharing educational information today. Um, we are not your financial advisor, not capital Y financial advisor. And so due to that fact, um, we uh, take no responsibility. Um, if you go out and you use a checkbook IRA to do the things that you should very much be doing additional research on, before you do them. Um, in case we haven't met, hello. It's very nice to meet you. Um, I am a financial advisor who started my company just a few years back. Um, and I am from San Francisco, California, uh, originally. And I'm currently co-located between San Francisco and Lisbon, Portugal, which is where I am coming to you live from today. So the outline today is going to be the do's and the don'ts and the how do you do um, investing in uh, self-directed IRAs. And so we're going to take you through uh, the number one importance of diversification, talk a little bit about the history of why this type of investment uh, came to be in the first place, and talk about why it's not so popular, talk about some of the other uh, important sort of um, cautionary facts um, with regards to this investment concept. So what is it? What is a checkbook IRA? Well, by definition, um, the checkbook IRA, aka uh, checkbook control IRA, is um, it's an account type essentially, um, which is hosted at a custodian that specializes in hosting this account type. Um, and so it has the flexibility to make investment decisions directly without needing any additional approval before you make these types of investments. And it requires a limited liability company within your IRA, which will enable you to manage the LLC and to have direct access to the funds via a checkbook. So you have control over the investments via a checkbook, hence the name checkbook IRA. It's a approved structure by the IRS tax courts and it gives you the ability to do a lot more than you can normally do inside of your IRA. Now, how is it different? Well, <clears throat> obviously, um, there are some big differences. Otherwise, we would not be talking about this today. Um, traditional IRAs are there to help you uh, invest in, like I said, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds, ETFs, you name it. There, there, there are more uh, investments uh, than I have time to talk about today that you can do in traditional IRAs. But the checkbook IRA allows you to invest in things that are not on the traditional menu, including real estate, private lending, precious metals, and a host of other things. They're flexible, meaning they're, they're, they're relatively quick. Um, because um, you are given control over your IRA with a checkbook, you can write a check for things um, that are an investment for your IRA account. Um, but they're, they're complex because of that fact. Um, I mean, we're, we're most of us, I think, in this room American, and we know that uh, freedom requires accountability. And when it comes to the checkbook IRA, 
the level of accountability is much higher. So you have to be the chief compliance officer for that account. You have to understand the full range of prohibited transactions that will get you into trouble with that account. All of the income and expenses need to be carefully recorded and um, and, and you have to basically be audit proof um, with regards to the investments you are doing. Um, traditional IRAs, on the other hand, require almost no due diligence. You just need to roll that 401k over and make sure that it gets into your IRA. And you can click buttons and invest in a whole range of things. Um, the setup and maintenance of uh, a self-directed IRA, checkbook IRA, can be difficult. It can be, but um, as we'll see, there is a lot of ways that you can actually take a shortcut with regards to that um, as well. In essence, you are going to need to be more proactive. Okay. Now, the importance of, uh, importance of diversification. Uh, <laughs> who doesn't love Monopoly? Okay. And this is what we're going to be playing with your checkbook IRA. So with the checkbook IRA, you have the potential to enhance the level of diversification that you are bringing into your situation. In other words, instead of just investing in, say, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ and the things that are available to us in mutual funds, everything else is game. So you want to buy real estate? You want to buy gold? Would you like to get parts of a private company? That is what we're talking about when we're talking about the checkbook IRA. So as an advisor, I don't hate when people bring to me the concept of investing in uh, a psychedelic fund, for example. Uh, there is some great scientific research that's being done. You can make a direct investment in this with a checkbook IRA. So as a broad overview, I find it fascinating that from a historical context, the opportunity is, is large for the, reason, um, for the reasons that I'm going to talk about. So what we're looking at here is the death of the pension plan. Going out of the uh, World War II in the United States, after World War II, there was a, uh, a, an abundance of growth um, in the industrial sector. The U.S. Um, was growing at a dizzying rate, and most individuals during that time were looking to companies and to the government to help them prepare for retiring. So 1983, everything kind of crests with pensions. And from then on, pensions began to slowly dwindle in popularity. At the same time, IRA accounts, uh, private sector, well, actually, this. So, so what this chart is showing us is you can actually see that there are annuities. There are some defined benefit plans, which are your... Um, your, your pensions, um, but you also have in these individual retirement accounts that are coming on. Um, and starting at about 1978, 1976, there were some important government acts um, that were uh, that that made it possible um, for individuals to make make tax advantaged deposits into their IRA accounts. So today, we have about 33 trillion dollars in U.S. assets that are in retirement accounts, of which about 12 million appear to be in IRAs. The checkbook control IRA has only been really possible since 1996. 1996. So if you think about it, <clears throat> it's not entirely surprising that people don't know a lot about the checkbook IRA. Um, we'll talk about some of the other reasons for that, but really the 1974 Employee Retirement Income Security Act, also known as ERISA, was really what laid the foundation for the rest of all of our defined contribution plans. So as Americans, before 1974, this wasn't even really a thing. But after 1974 and then 1978, there was the Revenue Act, which established the 401k. That was where the the, the, the opportunity really opened up and everybody started putting their tax deductible dollars towards their retirement accounts themselves. And in 1996, <clears throat> 96 was really the first time when it became possible to use a checkbook IRA. And so when I think about why it's not a mainstream option, I think about this guy from Mary Poppins, a movie that I watched frequently when I was a child. Um, the banker wants you to understand that it is uh, to him uh, that you must place your trust uh, and that you shall not take the coins yourself and maybe pay a tuppence to pay uh, for a bag to, <laughs> a bag of crumbs for the pigeons. 
but there are there's complexity and there are costs that are associated um, with with running your retirement accounts effectively and this is what um, the rather staid uh, banking and investments uh, complex would want you uh, to be afraid of so that you do not go out of your way uh, to control your own money I mean there is there is certainly some truth to that fact um, investors need to be more actively involved in the management uh, and sometimes day-to-day -day management of the investments that are happening in your checkbook IRA and um, you need to be ensuring um, you need to ensure that you're complying with IRS uh, guidelines um, and so there is a level of enhanced due diligence certainly literacy um, and commitment to running your your IRA like a business um, that most individuals are well, I shouldn't say most but many are not going to have um, a great deal of interest in but when we think about misconceptions that are spread by individuals like the aforementioned um, bank our archetypal banker one prevalent misconception is that they're just unsafe inherently and this is not true they're not inherently unsafe they are complex but as long as you allocate your investment funds in an intelligent manner at a custodian that's equipped to help um, you remain compliant those misconceptions are sort of misplaced um, but they are a barrier to widespread adoption um, that 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 is an experience that I've had as a professional is that individuals do want to go out and lead their lives the um, there is a higher degree of responsibility that's placed um, on your shoulders and so in, in the moment that you establish the LLC you need to really start kind of going through the documents the account opening documents and and sort of take your own temperature and and see whether you feel comfortable um, with the level of, of additional homework that you're going to need to take on and for those that do feel comfortable with that you do have additional rights in addition to your responsibilities didn't I say that there was rights okay we'll start with responsibilities so let's just imagine that you're taking your money let's say a hundred dollars you want to put it towards a um, a, a new investment that your friend has come up with we've got a hundred dollars the due diligence is the first thing that you must do unlike uh, a mutual fund where you can rely upon the management of that fund to do the work for you you are now essentially a business person with this money so you must in fact understand the premise of whatever it is that you are placing your money into because if it doesn't work out then your money is gone and so for all these non-traditional investments yeah, for for a hundred good ones, there are going to be, you know, a thousand bad ones um, that that are, are eager and waiting for your money. My mother always used to tell me, you know, you go out uh, with this new money that you got for your paper or your paper route, and the money will bolt, burn a hole in your pocket. There are plenty of people that want you to uh, to to give them uh, your money, and so you you must do the due diligence. You are also responsible for a great deal of record keeping. Um, and so you must maintain extremely accurate records and so we're talking again um, about running your money like a business so you have to log those checks that you write as exciting as it may sound to write that check to um, whatever deal um, that you want to get involved with within your IRA it's all got to uh, be reported very carefully and logged uh, in order to satisfy certain reporting requirements and so navigating the responsibilities that are associated with it require your willingness um, to to create spreadsheets um, and to um, keep receipts and to take income and carefully place it back into the account from whence it came meticulous record keeping so are you this guy are you going to be comfortable with uh, doing spreadsheets at home in your pajamas the LLC operating agreement number one is the first piece of the framework that needs to be put in place so um, when you you create your checkbook LLC you need to kind of go around and figure out how you want to create this typically it's taken care of for you by a custodial entity um, that will take responsibility um, if you want to reach out to me one-on-one -on -one, I'm happy to recommend a few different entities that I'm familiar with uh, but you want to make sure that you understand the prohibited transactions guidelines um, that the entities put forward onto you. Um, the bank account management 
you want to properly manage the bank account to ensure that all the transactions um, are for the benefit of the IRA and that they don't benefit disqualified persons. So this is the first place where we're, we're, we're seeing this term disqualified persons. So qualified investments are those investments in which you are making a monetary investment in to receive a monetary return for the benefit of the LLC. It's not a, a, a th this is actually a very central point. So if you're purchasing a piece of property, for example, that property cannot be held for the benefit of a, of a relative. That person is going to receive a non-financial uh, benefit from this. Um, that breaks the, uh, the checkbook IRA. And so that is just one of many, many examples of disqualified persons whom you might seek to benefit by placing an investment in your IRA like this. Um, there are ongoing educational requirements, um, just like the maintenance and running of any business. Um, you should be prepared to continue to keep up with changes in legislation, uh, various IRS uh, regulations um, that might affect your IRA or the LLC in the IRA. Because you see, now you have an IRA and you effectively have a business that's inside of the IRA, both of which may uh, experience, um, uh, there, there might be uh, legislation, changes in legislation that affect either one of those entities. And um, professional advice. Just like, again, any business owner, you should be prepared to enlist the aid of others where you are um, swimming way outside of your lane. Um, so um, I'm not the only type of advisor out in the world. There are, of course, a whole range of legal, tax, and other professional advisors that you may want to enlist to help you navigate um, the complexities um, that you're sure to come up against um, as you uh, run this type of investment. So what are the types of investments specifically which might be eligible or ineligible for investment in this, uh, in this type of vehicle? So there's an eligible investments. Number one, here's the monopoly guy again, real estate. Um, in fact, 90% of the time when I'm helping individuals with this, um, it is for the purposes of, of purchasing real estate. Um, people love to purchase real estate. It is, of course, one of uh, the steadiest ways uh, to invest and grow your money. And so it is, and it's probably one of the easiest ways to use a checkbook IRA um, as well. Private businesses. Um, I always love this, this picture of Elon Musk with his first McLaren. You can invest in individual businesses, any kind. So I'm thinking startup shares. If you have an individual that's sort of startup company, they'd like to be, uh, they'd like to receive your private investment. Um, you can indeed use a checkbook IRA uh, to invest in that type of investment. But uh, let's go back to principle number one, which is um, risk management. So this is probably not going to end up as well as. Uh, as the owner of the, the business would like you to believe, um, no matter how well intended they are. Precious metals. Um, precious metals is interesting because you can purchase these inside of many different uh, uh, products. Um, I'm thinking ETFs, mutual funds. There, there are various other ways that you can do this, but here you can purchase uh, precious metals and then store them for their inherent value. So if you want to, you can buy... Uh, gold bullion, for example, and you can store it away. Each of these different options allows the potential for diversification and growth, but again, caveat emptor. Be sure that you understand just exactly what level of risk you're accepting and ensure that you remain diversified as you make these investments. Ineligible investments. I love Beanie Babies. My mother did. Uh, at one point in time, she had a collection of 500 Beanie Babies, but if she had used her IRA to buy those Beanie Babies, due to the fact that they presented intrinsic value and enjoyment, they conflict with the retirement savings purpose of an IRA. Sorry, guys. Life insurance. Uh, life insurance um, is also not um, a type of contract um, that you can buy inside of your IRA's LLC which is as it should be, because you can purchase life insurance um, without creating the LLC structure. Um, and so if you were to, to use the LLC structure, it wouldn't be prudent in the first place. So don't do it. S-corporations, um, 
this is an interesting one. It's not directly prohibited, uh, but an S corporation um, effectively makes. Um, I mean, if you think about it, an S corporation is is a direct company itself. Um, so you've got kind of a Russian nesting doll problem going on here, and um, and it and it is made to be an ineligible investment for an IRA. So <clears throat> these are are just a few examples. There were many examples. Um, I think that the principle that underlies ineligibility is is that they cannot be um, they're they're essentially not investments that that you can personally enjoy the benefit of. There has to be a simple investment transaction taking place, and so in most cases where people bump up against ineligibility, it's because they're receiving some side benefit to the investment that they're making as well. Case study. I, as I've said many times before i love uh, living abroad i currently live in portugal and so in our hypothetical case for illustrative purposes we're going to consider john doe a 45 year old american entrepreneur living in portugal loves to invest in stocks and bonds but understands the benefits of diversification so um let's say that john has um half a million dollars in an ira and he doesn't have enough money in his, his taxable accounts. Well, that's a problem. But he does have this, this pot of money in his IRA. That's, that's his essential challenge. And there are complex regulations consider, concerning overseas investment for American expats. It makes it hard for him to directly invest under normal circumstances. However, this is a perfect case. Um, you know, rolling your existing IRA into a self-directing IRA is a, is a totally permissible transaction. So I take my IRA, $500,000. Let's call it a million because if I was to take all 500 to put it towards real estate, that would be a bad move. But let's let's take half and put it towards Portuguese real estate. We'll establish that LLC in IRA number two. We take IRA number one and we send $500,000 into IRA number two, where there is my LLC I've established. I don't go out and buy property right away. I go out and I, I do thorough research and do due diligence on potential investment opportunities. And I find two properties, each priced at $200,000, about 180,000 euros, and a renewable energy project as well. I place a $100,000 uh, investment, and I secure the units. That is a pretty much basic scenario. This is a standard scenario that you would see with the checkbook IRA. You go out, you find properties, you find investments that you believe in, and you purchase units of those investments. It's crucial to consult, well, <laughs> sit down here, it says, it's crucial to consult with advisors and tax professionals I think that's true um, to help uh, kind of understand where uh, the risk factors might be um, in any situation. But the outcome here is certainly what we might want to see, which is, you know, successfully purchasing rental properties, um, investing in small scale solar farm projects. Certainly uh, there, there is a case that could be made for that type of investment and in the end, achieving greater diversification of your retirement portfolio and possibly a little bit of additional satisfaction as well. Now, sometimes things don't work out. And so um, the other side of this is, of course, there are scams out there. Just as with any uh, investment, you need to do your homework. I have uh, uh, fallen prey to this just once. There was a friend of a friend um, who might or might not have met my friend at Burning Man, uh, that had a wonderful investment thesis um, for a water taxi service that um, did not ultimately work out. I think it might have been a scam, but I still haven't really gotten to the bottom of it. That is the nature of scams oftentimes. They look sound, and sound fantastic, but if you have not gone in and looked at the permits yourself, if you haven't taken a ride on the boat, or at least a prototype boat, then you, my friend, could be the victim of a hoodwink. Legal and tax implications, um, you know, this is essentially where we want to be meticulous with adhering to um, deemed distributions. So deemed distributions occur any time where it looks like you have basically taken the money into your own accounts. So I'll give you an example. 
um, it's it's actually totally permissible for you to create a company and then to write them the money from the LLC to another company. Sometimes people will do that when they're placing investments in other countries. But if that money makes its way back into your hands, let's say um, you buy a property and somebody writes a rent check back to you, you cash that rent check and you put it in your account, that's a distribution of that money because all of the funds needed to stay within the envelope of, of the LLC. And you, my friend, have just punctured the veil. So any way that the money could sort of slip back into your hands, and, and if, if there was, is an, an audit where that becomes uh, known, that's, that's the real danger here. And it happens all the time. It's just a natural thing for somebody to say, yeah, wire me the money. Um, you're a couple of days late. That's fine. I was focusing on something else. Oh, wait, you wired that to my personal account. Um, other types of prohibited transactions, um, engaging in transactions with family members or oneself. So you can't do business with yourself. You can't buy your own house. <laughs> That's really the first one that people break is, is they buy a vacation home and then they end up spending a lot of time in that vacation home. Actually, any time in that vacation home. That's you enjoying the benefits of the investment personally um, and not just your IRA. The IRA needs to be the only beneficiary uh, party here. Incorrect titling on investment accounts. Again, seems basic, but it's also something that happens. You title the investment account in your name and uh, gosh, the, the money's now yours. So it's, it's not okay. Um, Custodial uh, relationship. This is where you know you open up a few accounts at a custodial entity, and then you accidentally put the money back, but you put it into the wrong investment account. That that could end up costing you here as well. Um, legal complexities and compliance. I'm not going to go into the weeds with this. I think you can understand that running a company, um, depending on what kind of company it is, will uh, avail you of all kinds of additional. Uh, compliance uh, responsibilities. Oh, the McNulty versus the commissioner case study. There was an individual here that purchased gold and stored it at home. And it was found in, in this case, you can Google McNulty versus the commissioner. It's, it's kind of entertaining. The individual was showing the gold around and the individual loved the fact, I mean, who wouldn't, uh, that they had they had all this gold in their possession. And so the constructive receipt of that gold, the fact that they were enjoying it, hoarding it in, in their own home, um, the auditor found that, that, that this deserved to be deemed as a taxable distribution. And so that money went out of the account and he was deemed as a distribution. He got taxed uh, as if it was ordinary income. So avoid those mistakes when you set up your checkbook IRA. Definitely make sure that you go to a qualified party um, to establish this. As, as I said, there's there's several companies um, that you can do business with for whom this is the only way um, that they operate. So establish it by doing a direct rollover. Maintain accurate records and compliance. Understand the uh, prohibited transactions in detail. Learn the rules and the requirements. Um, and no commingling of funds. I think that's obvious, but it's it's the bottom line of doing checkbook IRA uh, transactions. And as individuals in the world, we sometimes can can forget on any given Tuesday. Um, stay informed and educated. So these are strategies for risk management. Just stay on the ball with regards to um, the the rules um, of the account itself. Diversify your portfolio. Don't take all your money and dump it into one thing, um, as exciting as that one thing may look. Um, work with the team of professionals. As I've said, diversify your, your talent. Don't just have one person working for you, that person being yourself. Uh, evaluate investment opportunities thoroughly and monitor and review your investments carefully. And um, I'll leave this for people that want to grab the full trial, the, the full... Um, the full deck here. Email me later and I will send you I will send you the entire deck. Although I will say this, this last piece is interesting. Um, the adoption of cryptocurrencies within them 
is is a is a real big problem um and and an opportunity uh for individuals that that uh that see it as such and the integration of artificial intelligence and in managing self-directed IRAs. I just threw this in for fun because um, it's affecting all of us in, in just about every industry these days. Um, and I have no doubt that there were going to be individuals that, uh, that jump into that arena as well. The rest of this is just sales copy, you guys. Uh, and you know me, I don't prefer it. Um, so, if you have them, I am happy to entertain some questions here during the Q&A session. I know that there's bound to be a few from you guys. Or, or possibly not. <laughs> I have to hand it to you. I mean, this was the most uh, kind of wonky topic that I could have chosen to do, but um, it's it's a quite a quite an important one, um, and and one that I have had some really interesting conversations recently around. All right, well, I'm gonna take that as a good sign <laughs> that I have talked this one to death. So um, so great. Well, if you're seeing this on the replay. Um, or, of course, if you're here in person, uh, thank you so much uh, for stopping by. And I hope that you will stop by next time um, as I continue to broaden my catalog of topics. Uh, but for now, that is, that is me. Uh, happy Easter and have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.